This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical or health advice. This podcast is not intended to replace professional medical advice, nor have the statements been evaluated by the US FDA or similar international bodies. We are not responsible for any losses, damages, or liabilities that may arise from the use of information shared during this podcast. The views expressed in this podcast may not be those of the host. Greetings, health and human enthusiasts, and welcome to the Regaining Health and Humanity podcast. I'm your trusted guide, Dr. Scott Johnson, and I'm both humbled and thrilled that you've chosen to join me on this fearless pursuit of knowledge and inspiration. My mission is to elevate your well-being naturally, arming you with evidence-based insights, revolutionary breakthroughs, and impactful health tactics. But that's not all. Together, We'll dive deep into the mysterious realms of human existence, unraveling the secrets of what makes us truly thrive. This podcast isn't just about information. It's a catalyst for change. Join me in confidently exploring potent natural solutions, cutting-edge health strategies, and igniting courageous conversations that cultivate meaningful connections and foster empathy for humankind. I'm here to empower you to unleash your extraordinary potential and lead a life jam-packed with boundless health and happiness. So get ready. Your extraordinary journey to boundless health and happiness starts now. Hello, listeners, and thank you for joining us on another episode of the Regaining Health and Humanity podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Johnson, and I am thrilled you're listening. Today, I've invited Dr. Catherine Ega Phillips, or Dr. K, to talk about hacking your epigenetics. She is an award-winning international speaker and a holistic humanitarian. She focuses on the power of mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual wellness. Dr. K uses her private integrative medicine practice to provide her community with holistic and natural and authentic medicine delivered by a team of like-minded practitioners. She also offers a virtual mentorship program where she creates space for personal development and elevating your consciousness. Dr. K maximizes her life's purpose by providing necessary tools and coaching for people to access genuine wellness, holistic elevation, and a fulfilling reality. And with her, we are going to dive into the complex topic of epigenetics and explore how today's choices actually may improve the outcomes for generations to come. So welcome, Dr. K. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is a topic that I'm always fascinated with. Uh, I wrote a book about this with a colleague of mine several years ago and how essential oils affect epigenetics. And we are just learning more and more about how the things that we're doing today affect what's going to happen to how our genes express. So first, I think we should really define epigenetics. Um, because it is a fascinating but very complex topic. How would you simply explain epigenetics to somebody who doesn't know anything about the topic? Yeah, I love this question because I feel that, to your point, epigenetics is rising. It's becoming more and more so into people's awareness. So I think it's important to make sure that we're always on the same page about what it is because as it started kind of trending, so to speak, mm-hmm. um, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of information pushed out about it, but I'm also seeing a lot of misinformation pushed out as well, which is why I'm so excited for this conversation today. But um, for me, epigenetics is like an ocean. 
in and of itself. And you can take different aspects of that ocean and you can dive deeper into that for like the rest of your life. So there's this kind of tunnel vision look at epigenetics as, well, it's just how your lifestyle affects your genes. That's like mm -hmm. one piece. <laughs> of the, like one chocolate chip on a chocolate right. chip that um, it just, it's just such a vast concept. And to make it as simplified as possible, I would say that epigenetics is the study of changes in gene expression that do not, and this is the most important part to me, do not involve alteration to the underlying DNA right. itself. So we are not manipulating physically the actual DNA itself, but we're altering the expression. That's a very powerful thing. So um, we can alter the expression or, you know, kind of manipulate the expression or modulate it through external factors. So like mm -hmm. emotional factors, um, environmental factors, lifestyle factors, and um, these marks that are on the gene, we're seeing that they are persisting through replication. So it is kind of generational, as you said, like what we're doing now can affect health outcomes from ages and ages and ages to come. So I'll just close by saying, I like to look at it as like a, um, if you can imagine your genome, like your entire complete set of DNA as like a library, mm -hmm. And within that library, it has a bunch of books that each of your cells can access. And depending on the type of cell, if it's a, a, a neuron, if it's a muscle cell, it will only access certain books, like certain books will be read or expressed. So then you can look at epigenetics as like a set of notes or bookmarks or highlights that kind of nudge or dictate which books get read more often. Mm -hmm. or ignored completely. So I think that's a simple way of, of looking at epigenetics. Yeah, I like that uh, definition and explanation. And th the key really is then we want to guide our genes to read the books that we want it to read that'll be beneficial, right? We don't want to bring garbage into our DNA and to our genetics because we're guiding it to read garbage uh, books. So I really like that concept. Yeah. Can you explain the concept of epigenetic memory and uh -huh. how it relates to long-term health outcomes? Yes. Yeah, so this is probably, when I talked about the different chocolate chips on the cookie of epigenetics, this is probably my favorite <laughs> chocolate chip. <laughs> so epigenetic memory for me explains a lot, even beyond health outcomes it explains a lot even spiritually for me from a sense of ancestral connection because epigenetic memory basically refers to the fact that there is, as I mentioned before, a persistence of epigenetic marks on the DNA that can influence gene expression and patterns just generation after generation after generation. And this is crucial for the development, for the differentiation of the cells, um, if we are wanting to kind of hack the system, right, if I have tapped into a, a more elevated wellness for myself, mm -hmm. I would want that for those coming after me. And I can take certain actions today that can cause certain marks that can influence my genetic expression for my children and my children's children just by me being exposed to certain environments or certain experiences that can cause these changes. And then now I'm lifting entire health risks that pro may have been running in my family, or it may not have. And I just want a more amplified, more elevated way of living for those coming after me. So I think this is a very powerful and very empowering concept because you kind of carry a lot of the magical powers that people think, oh, life is just happening to me because that's the way my genes or that's what runs in my family. You know, like you have a lot more say so in the matter than perhaps you thought. That's very powerful to me. Yeah, that that 
statement that you made about being able to change generational outcomes is something that is really important to me as well as I look at my children and how I want my grandchildren to be and the ability to hopefully pass on to them not only um, natural holistic ways of living and uh, healthy lifestyles but also some genes that will respond to those healthy lifestyles and then have uh, positive impacts on future generations um, is, is just remarkable that we have that opportunity. It is. It's like a, a head start or like a cheat sheet almost <laughs> at, with mm -hmm. life to be able to, to do that when you really understand and tap into that. So, yeah. Yeah. And we're, we're starting to even learn and, and I've seen some animal models showing, for example, where, um, if, if the males or the fathers were obese at the time that they oh. conceived these offspring, that they were more likely to pass on genes that made their offspring more, uh, more susceptible to being obese and mm -hmm. the opposite was true if they were healthy yeah. um at a healthy weight when they conceived that they passed on these genes that were making their children more their offspring more able to maintain that healthy weight and so that kind of jumps me right into my next question is the lifestyle choices that we make such as the physical activity we get stress management the nutrition things like that how do those kind of lifestyle choices impact the epigenetic markers and subsequently influence gene expression yes so this is this is pretty much the the creme de la creme of epigenetics here is first even understanding what the lifestyle is um, I talk to a lot of people who are like, oh, I eat well. And I'm <laughs> like, yeah, diet is like one facet of the lifestyle. But we do have to consider diet, hydration, nutrient acquisition, not just how you're taking things in, but also how you are eliminating. But then there are these other categories that should not be ignored and need equal attention and energy, just like rest or sleep, which are both not the same. They're not synonymous. Correct. Um, also, <laughs> also physical activity, how mm -hmm. much are you moving your body, um, stress management, big, big, big one. Um, you may not be able to control the stresses in your life, but you can control your body's response to them and elevate that. Um, also toxin exposure, like yeah. how are you actively working to reduce your toxic load? And for me, those make up what I refer to as the lifestyle. So yes, Exercise and moving can influence epigenetic markers tremendously. Um, stress management can as well. And there's scientific research that backs all of this. But I want to highlight that just as we can work hard to positively impact the genetic expression, that means the inverse is also true. Mm hmm. So if I am poorly managing my stress, if I'm not moving, I can then, through this genetic memory, it's like your genes are remembering things, right? So if I go through a tremendous stressor, even just like as a collective, like um, the Holocaust or slavery, you know, that's something that I have to understand that I have inherited a predisposition to my HPA axis being more sensitive, perhaps, mm -hmm. or a fight or flight response, as people call it, being more sensitive. I'm not starting at an equal playing field as my peers. So I then have to move accordingly and understand that I could then be more susceptible to health conditions that come as a result of heightened stress response, just going, 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 fight or flight, so that I take the extra precautions to fight against that, even though I might feel like, oh, my life is great. It's not really that stressful. I have to understand that which came before me. And that's where what we're talking about now is, you know, understanding for going forward, but also understanding what has happened before you, uh, whether directly or just at large, like collective consciousness. Yeah, I, I I agree. We have to maintain that connection with our ancestors and know what they went through so that we can then break these generational cycles and hopefully make this shift. 
in our generation. So future generations don't have that um, unequal playing field. Uh, uh, nutrition is huge because what we consume is going to be broken down and used by the body to have all kinds of systems work and have uh, impact on all systems in the body. So can you discuss any specific dietary components that have been shown to modulate gene expression and the process of epigenetics and how do they affect our health and maybe even our well-being? Oh, yeah. So I'm a strong advocate for very nutrient-dense eating. Um, I don't really subscribe to different trending diets of, of the day. Um, really, I subscribe to a way of eating that gives you the biggest bang for your buck when it comes to nutrient acquisition and inflammation reduction. Mm -hmm. right, so with that being said, I think it's so cool how <laughs> within the nutrient dense foods, there are certain foods and definitely certain nutrients that can modulate epigenetic processes. So for example, compounds that we refer to as antioxidants. So, mm -hmm. so things that are in your green teas and your berries and your anything that's really black food, black rice, black berries, black beans, um, your cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, leafy greens, etc. cetera. Um, these can influence the addition of or removal of these epigenetic marks on your DNA that would, again, affect your gene expression without altering the structure itself. And mm -hmm. they will then go forward to play a role in helping to reduce your risk for chronic disease, for de degenerative disease, for inflammatory conditions um, like heart diseases and um, autoimmune situations and cancers that you were never intended to have in the first place. But now through your eating, you can not just manipulate this in a positive way for you, but again, as we said, for those coming after you. Yeah, I always like to tell people that your body craves nutrients, not calories. And so <laughs> I like that word nutrient dense, because if we're giving our body these nutrients, then the body responds better than if we just give calories and calories and calories that don't provide those nutrients. I think another aspect of our health that is just in today's society is almost dismissed entirely is sleep. So yeah. <laughs> what impact does sleep quality and duration have on epigenetic regulation and how can optimizing sleep habits contribute to overall health through epigenetics? Oh, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I don't know why this one always gets the short end of the stick. I, I really don't know. And we have such strong, compelling research around it from all angles. So I, I, I don't know why we're in this culture of sleep deprivation and suppression and I'll sleep when I'm dead and work, work, work. <laughs> we're like, like machines, you know, and sleeping is critical. We see changes even with the, the loss of 60 minutes during daylight savings time. We see an uptick in heart condition. Mm -hmm. So it's like there's very clear data around this. And when we talk about sleep, you have to talk about both the quality and the duration, right? Because everyone is just like, oh, seven to, to nine hours of sleep for the average adult. But the quality, someone could be sleeping for seven to nine hours, but could be achieving the quality of three because mm -hmm. the sleep is interrupted, is broken. It's just not as seamless as it's supposed to be. So poor sleep, right? Difficulty falling asleep, difficulty staying asleep. Um, you're, you're wrestling and tossing around, um, possible sleep disturbances going on that are outside of your control. A lot of them that are inside of your control, like hormone imbalances have to be addressed because poor sleep can lead to adverse epigenetic modifications that then may cause an uptick in your risk for obesity. Mm -hmm. um, and then all the things that ensue that come from that, you know, now we're talking metabolic dysfunction. Now we're again talking these chronic conditions and these degenerative de de conditions that you were not supposed to have. So yeah, mm -hmm. just even by slightly optimizing your sleep habits, you can overall maintain a healthier, more uh, balanced epigenetic profile that would just elevate your total lifestyle and the expression of your genes as a whole. Yeah, we kind of touched, touched on this topic earlier about intergenerational health. Mm 
Um, but do you, what would you tell to our listeners about how individuals can make informed lifestyle choices today to positively influence future generations? I would say for one, just meet yourself where you are, right? I would tell people not to try to bite off more than they can chew because in the energy of overwhelm comes a lot of, oh, I, I quit or this is too much, or I can't do this. So I would just say with the different facets of the lifestyle that I mentioned, maybe focusing on one at a time, right? Or like one per week or even one per month. I would also say collaborating with a professional or an expert who is proficient in speaking directly to the lifestyle and how to balance it and elevate it. So it may not look like your conventional PCP, you may have your conventional PCP, and then you might need other people in your corner to help make sure that the lifestyle is completely addressed, like a health mm -hmm. coach or like a, a more um, integrative provider or a practice that is addressing all of these in every single protocol that you are, you know, actually going through. And I would say even just conversation like being able to access platforms like yours to hear this mm -hmm. and to have the awareness of this and the inspiration that comes from this, like, oh, I'm, I'm excited now. I didn't look at it that way. So now I want to go work on this a little bit more, reading books, getting educated, you know, working again with people who may have programs, who may have online courses, who may have coaching where they can walk you through how to take this up a notch and up a notch and up a notch. So now you're making informed lifestyle choices to help ensure a positive impact on your health and the health of your future generations are actually occurring versus taking the passive route of, well, I'll just start with diet and exercise and see what happens mm -hmm. <laughs> <from there. laughs> the way our country is kind of geared to do. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned books because uh, I, I really feel passionate about sharing information that I've learned. And, and that's why I do spend um, a lot of my time writing books, because I think that that has the opportunity to have a great impact on a wide variety of individuals because books are highly accessible. People can read, you can listen to them, you can um, take them with you on your phones now as eBooks. And so I I'm hoping that people are, are finding good books. Um, and I understand you've written a book as well. So there's, there's lots of books and good information out there where we live in an information age where there's information overload and it's just good that we find the right people to get our information from so that we don't get caught in the misinformation cycle or myths that keep us down the wrong track. Absolutely. Are there any natural solutions or alternative therapies that have been shown to modify epigenetic patterns and what evidence supports their efficacy? Oh, wow. No, there are tons. <laughs> tons. <laughs> um, in fact, in, in my book, No Time to Waste, I tried to create it in a way that it was almost like a guide so that you can have some handholding through each bucket of the lifestyle and mm -hmm. the therapies that would complement those, you know, and the different interventions and natural solutions that would complement those. So yeah, even just at my practice, I offer, first of all, I, I can't stress enough the nutrients. I know I've said it a thousand times, but really to your point, the body functions off of nutrients and will perceive foreign things that really aren't breaking down into nutrients as toxins. So we have to make sure we're getting adequate nutrition into the body. So I offer at my practice IV nutrient therapy to okay. where I can basically intravenously pour nutrients back into your body. <laughs> and that in and of itself, it does wonders for people, you know, who are just starting out on protocols. Um, but again, as I mentioned, physical activity, I do have events where I'm helping people move. I have partnerships with different coaches and trainers where I'm helping to get patients and clients moving more. Um, the other big one for me would be stress. So I tend to lean very heavily into that bucket just because prior to the pandemic, the statistic was that roughly around 70% of 
all of the underlying causes of why people were coming to be seen was stress related. And that was before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. so only God knows where we are today. That number. <laughs> but I was just like, I have to help my people with stress. So for me, it's mindfulness practices. I have conscious breathing guides, like guided meditations on my YouTube channel. I'm talking to people about conscious eating, about conscious, even hydrating, about consciousness itself and just connecting with other species of consciousness, like spending time in nature. Um, I talk to people about if you can't get to nature, bring nature to you. And that's why I love using things like essential oils, because if I can't run into a forest to gather all the chemical constituents that I would get in that forest bathing experience, I can bring oils to me that carry mm -hmm. the same chemical constituents and diffuse it in my, in my diffuser or just, you know, smell it. So there are a lot of therapies that complement this. We can go into like traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture, acupressure. We can go into just physical manipulation, massage, different levels of, um, of physical um, therapy almost to help the body to regenerate from injury. We can go into different ways of moving your body. If you are not really used to moving it, we can start with slow stretching. If you're an athlete, we can take that activity potential up to the next level. It's just, we have so much to do and so much research still to obtain. Research is just ongoing, that there's evidence all over the place to support all of this. So I feel that the more we can do to just support every facet of the lifestyle, well, how can we get you sleeping better? How can we rule out reasons for your sleep being interrupted? And those therapies that are complemented with like just every facet of the lifestyle detoxification that we can do, the more, the better to me. Yeah, much of the stuff that you're sharing is very aligned with the first episode where I uh, shared lifestyle and how important mm -hmm. lifestyle is. And that if you get your lifestyle dialed in, then these natural solutions that are available to us work so much better. And so we shouldn't look at... Um, natural solutions as just substitutes for other options that are available, but we should actually look at them as supporting our lifestyle. And so I'm so glad that you're, you have such a strong emphasis on these lifestyle behaviors and how they are going to influence our overall health. One of the things that is a big topic right now is everybody's trying to find ways to slow the aging process. Nobody wants to look older. Nobody wants to feel older. And um, there's a lot of emphasis in research on this. But are there specific epigenetic changes associated with aging? And how can lifestyle interventions potentially slow down or reverse these changes that occur? Yeah, I... Um... I call this like tapping into the fountain of you. So the, that narrative, I feel that I kind of stumbled up upon this by just doing it to myself. So before I even had the vernacular and terminology of oh epigenetics, epigenetic marks, okay, this this is what's going on. I knew that if I could elevate all of the different areas I mentioned before within the lifestyle that I'm going beyond disease reversal prevention, you know, like it's, it's transcending even my physical realm and it's going outward. So yes, aging itself is associated with specific epigenetic changes um, like alterations to, to DNA methylation patterns. Mm -hmm. Another facet of epigenetics that is not really talked about a lot um, are the inclusion of or removal of these groups that get attached to the DNA helix, right? Um, like the methyl groups, the acetyl groups, or removing them, right? And, and if you don't have, if you're not aware of this or don't have a team around you that are aware of this, then it just kind of caps your potential to influence these epigenetic markers to even be able to slow down the aging process in the first place. So yes, there are positive implications around 
elevating your diet, elevating your physical activity, elevating your stress management and reducing the amount of stress that you're under altogether, uh, reducing the amount of toxins that you're taking in, but also increasing the amount that you are excreting intentionally, then we have arrived at this thing that people are calling Mm anti-aging. And it's like reverse aging is what I call it. Like I feel myself as I've been on this journey for me, I feel like stronger. I feel more balanced. I feel more solid. I feel more energized. And people are always like, are you old enough to be my doctor? Are you old enough? to?" (laughs) (laughs) How old are you really? (laughs) And I didn't notice this until I was really going hard on the lifestyle, the different areas. Um, and it was so profound that I, again, had to write about it in my book because I'm like, okay, I'm, the data is, is me, is here. Um, I'm moving with more agility, with more flexibility. I train with a professional athletic coach. So I'm doing drills with like soccer and football players and stuff and lifting heavy weights. And I just feel like I reversed, like I went backwards in time. Mm-hmm. And still have the wisdom that I have now. It's it's quite interesting. And so we don't want to encourage looking for these quick fixes and there are these products that guarantee anti-aging and put this cream to get, you know, like if, if you ignore <laughs> the lifestyle, then now we're just pouring water into a bucket with a hole in the bottom and we're just wasting endless money, dollars and time on these different quick fixes and get young quick schemes where this is it. This is the fountain of youth right here. Yeah. Uh, the the fountain of youth really is lifestyle. And so I'm glad that, that that's, um, that's being pointed out because there are so many people who are just looking for the simple quick fix that's going to help them age more gracefully. And uh, unless you do have these lifestyle foundational factors established, then you're not going to get the results that you hope or, or wish to to have. My feeling is better understanding of genetic factors, including epigenetic modifications that influence the metabolism of, the uh, responses to, and the incidences of adverse reactions to um, therapeutic interventions leads to better patient outcomes. Do you see a future where epigenetics will be more integrated into medicine, and how do you see this impacting treatments? I do see that. I feel that right now I'm kind of what I'm doing and teaching and promoting and creating at my practice is kind of a little bit before it's time. (laughs) And I feel that there's going to come a time very soon where a lot of of the practices are going to change in this direction. I feel that there is a huge surge in the recognition of what we're talking about today especially since the pandemic. I feel like the pandemic really challenged people's perspective of what healthcare actually means. Like, what does that really look like? And to be guided down that wellness journey, what does that look like? And how can I set myself up to not become a victim to something like a pandemic, you know, to where I can be, when we talk about survival of the fittest, I'm one of the fittest. And I feel that because of the growing research and conversations and books that are emerging I, I around epigenetics, just even the fact that it's been named, <laughs> that it's, it's been coined as epigenetics. Because when I first started studying this, I wasn't calling it epigenetics. I was just calling it lifestyle modification mm-hmm. um, until I, I would definitely have to shout out Dr. Bruce Lipman. Um, Lipton was like my entryway into, oh, this thing has a name. (laughs) This is a theme that is gaining recognition. Yes. And I went down the rabbit hole of of his interviews and his books and his um, publishings and articles and programs. And I was just like, this is this thing is going to catch fire. So I do. I'm excited because I can feel the future emerging here. 
And I see within like colleagues, people are coming to me by the droves. Like, can you teach me? <laughs> can you teach me how to integrate my practice? Can you teach me how to be more holistic minded like you? Can you teach me how to, to access people? I'm a dermatologist, cardiologist, uh, and I want to be integrative cardiology. I want to be integrative gynecology. So I do see that the interest is growing there. And with the more research that's done and the more data that's pushed out, it, it definitely, there's no choice but to include it in the conversation at that point. Yeah, that's my feeling similarly, that anybody who is not embracing this is going to be Left outdated behind. and left behind. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's just uh, one last question. Are there any ongoing research studies or promising developments in the field of epigenetics that focus on lifestyle um, interventions, uh, natural solutions, and what potential do they hold for future healthcare outcomes? Yeah, I think you kind of touched on it before. I think it's quite interesting the amount of research and study that's going on focused around treatments and like how patients are responding to different treatments or even different medications or having adverse reactions or not, or um, how different marks are then manipulating drug metabolism overall. And now people are kind of like, hmm, I have to look over here now because the protocols have been the same for ages and ages and ages, but something is manipulating them because I gave the same protocol to person A and person B, but person B is getting better three times as fast. What is the mm -hmm. difference? And now you have to include these other factors that were not once included, or at least not seriously <laughs> and as in-depthly included as it was before within conventional medicine. So I think that for me, it's exciting to see the research around clinical medicine regarding epigenetics, because when I was originally speaking of lifestyle interventions and research and ongoing um, data collection and projects regarding this, I was talking to like other holistic <laughs> people, you know, and people who were already on the boat. They were already on board. And then the people who were not were just like, yeah, that's woo woo. <laughs> you know, that <laughs> that's not real. <laughs> you know, just focus over here. So I think that this ongoing research in the clinical space is once again, forcing people to have to look at this, not because I said it, or because you don't believe me, but you have to believe the research, the data, the numbers don't lie. And what we're seeing in real life does not lie. And if you want to enhance the future of medicine as we know it, you have to include these. You have to. It is imperative. Um, we can't talk about elevating a system, uh, the healthcare system, especially in this country, without including these things. And I hear this often where people are like, the system is broken. Mm -hmm. that their system is broken. And I don't, I look at it as, you know, systems when they were created, the genesis of the system at the time that it was created, it was perfect for the time that it was created. And if there are imperfections let down the road, either the reason it was created, you know, is no longer relevant or the system itself is no longer relevant. So I just feel that at the time that our country created our current healthcare model or healthcare system, it was very reactive. Right. It was very infectious disease. Boom. Take this. Okay. Acute situation. Boom. Take this. And what happened is over time, because of the lifestyle, <laughs> We have thrown or catapulted ourselves into these situations that are way more chronic than originally intended to be, mm -hmm. way more long lasting. And now you're not just on the drug, off the drug, you're just on it. And then it's, it's not as effective after that long of a term. So then you have to, I, I feel like part of fixing the system is just really just being inclusive of the lifestyle. Mm -hmm 
I think that that'll just take us up several notches by itself. Yeah, I totally agree that there's there's been a somewhat of a lack of of even recognizing lifestyle contributions to what the the health states that people are in, and um, we've been very reactive. We need to be more proactive. We need to make people more responsible for their own health by having them focus on their lifestyle, and we can see dramatic changes. Mm -hmm. I think this conversation has been very uplifting and very informative. And um, to to me, it provides a lot of hope to know that we we can, as individuals, make better choices for our lifestyle that can not only affect us and make us be healthier, but also potentially make generations to come more healthy. So I really appreciate you taking some time to, to share all this information with us today. Oh, yeah, of course. This is my favorite thing to talk about. So like I would like a thousand times come back and talk about this. I love it. And thank you for creating this space. It's such a safe, authentic space to even have this conversation. And I just want as many people as possible to to view this because I still talk to people who are like, you have to drink water every day. So I... <laughs> realize that there's a spectrum that we're dealing with and a lot of work has to be done, but it does start here with awareness and education. So I'm always very appreciative of the brilliant minds that create platforms to share education and awareness. Well, thank you. That is definitely the goal is to create more awareness and and help people to find information that can impact their lives and hopefully improve. Uh, that That's the goal and and having great guests on like you helps me to share that content and that information. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you for investing your precious time with us today. I trust you've uncovered valuable insights to elevate your health and enhance your quality of life. If you're hungry for more evidence-based wisdom to transform your well-being, I invite you to check out my 20 plus books, all waiting to be explored on my website, authorscott.com. Don't miss out on the chance to supercharge your knowledge. Please share, like, and subscribe to be part of the movement revolutionizing lives. In a world drowning in noise and endless information, your share can be the beacon that guides others to a better life. Together, let's make a difference by amplifying the life-changing knowledge you've gained today. Until next time, here's to your journey to boundless health and unbridled happiness. Say my